Hi everybody, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. My talk is called Rethinking the Place of Identity Politics and Collaboration in Contemporary Canadian and American Literary Criticism. The place of identity and collaboration in Western humanities scholarship has long been a controversial and contested issue that persists in evolving formulations today. For our shared purposes throughout this week, thinking through the potentialities, limitations, and pitfalls of the rhetorical implementation of identity politics as they relate to the successful fostering of transcommunal academic collectives is important. The issue of borders is equally as pertinent in considering how identity and collaboration can function to enhance or erase one another, especially in the context of a group such as the Brazil Canada Knowledge Exchange that operates across a plethora of borders, geographic, cultural, disciplinary, and generational, to name a few. While acknowledging that identitarian concerns can be both a tool to overcome borders as well as a method for creating them, I aim to stress that sociocultural differences are not the primary source of divisiveness or, or barriers to productive collaboration, but rather the unequal allocation of power based on these differences. Through a brief and far from comprehensive survey of past and present critiques of identity politics in academia and other social arenas, and through some ruminations on my own experiences with collaboration as a recent Canadian graduate student in the field of literary criticism, I do not plan to advocate for one understanding of the role of identity politics, but rather to speculate about how considerations of identity facilitate or complicate border traversing collaboration in academia and invite speculation and clarification from all of you. A bit of unpacking of debates around identity politics is useful before proceeding to the implications for the formation of transcommunal or border crossing collectives. Perspectives on identity politics, both theoretically and in practice, often oscillate between the uncritical championing of identity above all else and the equally as hazardous uncritical erasure of identity in contemporary Canadian and American literary criticism. Borrowing Olaf Kaltmeier and Sebastian Thie's generalized definition from their insights on identity politics as a field in the Americas, which describes identity politics as a compound term denominating the strategic use of cultural or collective identities and a vast array of forms of social practices, helps set the stage for an examination of some critiques. Specifically focusing on the social practice of institutionalized studies of language, literature, and representation in post-secondary education in Canada and the United States reveals a diversity of criticism that unites some unexpected schools of thought and political leanings. Criticism of identity politics has been virtually coextensive with the inception of the term, with thinkers fearing that an emphasis on difference would interfere with potential alliances between marginalized subjectivities, perpetuate essentializing stereotypes, and cause other social damage. In a comparative study of identity politics debates in France, the United States, and Brazil, entitled Race and Translation, Culture Wars Around the Post-Colonial Atlantic, Ella Shohat and Robert Stamm reveal the diverse origin points of some of these critiques. As they explore claims that identity politics are both ethnocentric and narcissistic, Shohat and Stamm unpack the partial convergence between ideological adversaries, as several right-leaning and left-leaning thinkers dismiss identity politics, with significant quarrels not only between the multicultural left and the monocultural right, but also within the left concerning the relative importance of class, race, gender, and sexuality, and the shifting relations between the various theoretical grids, such as Marxism, feminism, and post-structuralism. While many leftist scholars have begun calling for a post-identity politics, there has been a recent increase in attacks from more conservative academic factions. Identity politics remain a primary target for those who advocate for traditional humanities scholarship, dismissing identity politics as justification for self-interest groups to attack the canon and thereby compromise disciplinary standards. For example, William Chase, president of Emory University, which was recently ranked one of the top 20 post-secondary institutions in the United States, attributes the current failure of North American English literature departments partially to the substitution of the books themselves for a scattered array of secondary considerations, such as identity studies, abstruse theory, and sexuality. 
and to the increase of enterprising students coming from immigrant backgrounds with only slender connections to Western culture and with less interest in studying texts representative of a special national interest. Provocatively, the increasingly globalized composition of North American campuses is positioned as a co-conspirator with a problematized interest and identity in the destruction of the quality, popularity, and utility of English literature departments. Mm -hmm. The crossing of various borders, disciplinary, geographic, and those of identity, and the related reduction in purely nationalistic interests are a source of clear discomfort for Chase. These types of critiques and their implicit denial that Western humanities scholarship has predominantly functioned through identity politics, with mainly heteronormative white males studying other mainly heteronormative white male authors, belie primarily unfounded anxieties, as exemplified, for instance, by scholarship that reveals the historical intersection of the decline of authorial control over textual interpretations and the rise of post-colonialism. As aptly put by Shohan Stem, why should only the dominant Euro-American group have its narcissism massaged by official histories, while others suffer the body blows of stereotype and marginalization? In this context, Chase's uneasiness towards more diverse campuses with students with more diverse interests and his intertwined skepticism towards identity studies becomes more clear, although remaining just as reductive. In short, dismissals of identity politics can function to bolster the hegemony of a dominant group and minimize border crossing potential. It is true that interest in identity politics inspire reconfigurations in the conventional archives, structures, and goals of literary departments, but as Shohat and Stam maintain, this is not a matter of lowering standards, but rather of raising them by requiring knowledge of more cultures, more languages, and more perspectives. For instance, the resistance of critics of identity politics to what Shohat and Stam term a literary pedagogic coup d'etat, aiming to expel the notorious dead white males from the literary canon, substitutes simplistic erasure for more complex rethinking. For instance, Shakespeare is not banned, but anti-colonial perspectives on Shakespeare add nuance to pre-existing scholarship. Furthermore, these critiques ignore the fact that considerations of identity, far from being secondary, are crucial in developing a sense of self, and by extension, are pertinent for professional development, rethinking pedagogical approaches, and for the formation of collectives inside and outside of the academy. This brings up the intersection of identity politics and academic collaboration. Significantly, Kaltmeier and Thies claim that identity politics are set at the interface between subjectivity and community, staking out a crucial territory for the transition from scholarly singularity to transcommunal collectives of thought, an intervention of particular interest for academics <coughs> in the Western humanities. Leslie A. Real, in a brief comparative essay on differences in collaborative practices in the sciences and the humanities, summons the stereotypical yet prevalent model of the solitary scholar that dominates the humanities, seeming isolated and lonely. While humanities research often explores the formation of communities, forms of relating, and other sociocultural forces, these interests influence the content of humanities scholarship much more than they impact the conception and or construction of academic output. Although multi-authored texts are the norm in the sciences, the monograph still seems to reign supreme in much of the Western humanities. Perhaps the deep interest in identity of many humanities scholars is a reason for the lower incidence of formalized collaboration, as heightened awareness of difference and sense of self encourage independent projects. But it could also be mobilized as a reason why we can collaborate more effectively. Certainly, many humanities scholars strive to think collectively and break down the borders of selfhood in theory, if not in practice. For instance, several academics in queer theory, a field that largely evolved out of literary criticism, share a utopian impulse of collectivity in much of their writing. In a move that is both rhetorical and politicized, many queer theorists deploy the first person plural, we, throughout their texts, invoking ideas of collective formation and community identity. In the conclusion of his book, Cruising Utopia, The Then and There of Queer Fertuity, Jose Esteban Munoz states that from shared critical dissatisfaction, we arrive at collective potentiality, indicating that transformative possibilities in academia come from community movements. 
However, Mimiosis We remains locked in the realm of the abstract, as his multi-voiced claims derive from his own singular perspective throughout the monograph, representative of a critical disconnect between thinking about and enacting communal scholarship. It is a bit surprising that other disciplines have led the way in the production of multi-author texts, those in the sciences, technology, education, and creative arts, given the focus of fields like literary and cultural criticism and queer theory on exploring models of collectivity. The relative regularity of formalized collaboration in these disciplines contrasts to a gap that persists between much of the theory and practice in Western literary and cultural criticism, one that relegates concepts like Jasbir Fuar's assemblages or Donna Haraway's contact zones to the level of the formal and purely theoretical. It was out of reflections such as these that a group of peers and I began to meet, discuss, and formally collaborate. What started as an informal reading group interested in low theory and unconventional archives has now become an official research cluster on queer biopolitics at the University of Manitoba, a group I am thoroughly indebted to for the thoughts I am sharing today. Through our brief time together so far, this group has aimed to interrogate some of the attitudes and tendencies in academia regarding identity politics and collaboration that I have been touching on. Of interest, Cult Mind these touch on the timeliness of rethinking the relationship of identity and collaboration, stating that new media and more democratic forms of media participation, especially in the World Wide Web and its new social media, allow for the increased interconnectedness of social actors, who are then able to expand their strategic claims for recognition of difference to globalized public spheres. Well, these claims are perhaps even more crucial for a formerly transnational group like the Brazil Canada Knowledge Exchange. Technology and internet connectivity facilitated a textual collaboration between the queer biopolitics cluster while our members were geographically scattered during the writing and editing process, though all institutionally linked to the University of Manitoba. This written project is based on a Japanese genre of poetry known as Ranga, in which multiple poets write stanzas one after another that incorporate a theme or image from a previous stanza, ultimately creating a final linked poem. The various stanzas in our textual mediation <coughs> ranged in focus from Jacques Derrida's thoughts on animality to the role of zombies in popular culture, an archive without generic or conventional borders. The six authors involved, writing across borders between our positions in the academic hierarchy, research interests, and life experiences, co-wrote and co-edited a piece that was largely facilitated by an open source text editor, making alterations to each other's writing in a way that was often simultaneous and anonymous and always non-prescriptive. The politics of identity were crucial both to the ideas we unpacked as well as to our methodology. The consciousness that a physical invisibility through the medium of writing cannot stifle the valences of privilege and difference that operate between us remains prevalent as we viewed identity <coughs> politics as, to quote Cult Mayan Thies, constellations of social actors interacting and communicating with one another on the basis of a set of partially shared beliefs, despite the radical asymmetry of power with which their social positions are viewed. Despite diverse and vehement dismissals of identity politics, a joint perspective that our role in academia is intimately linked to the belief that our worlds and our history are worthwhile topics of study, and the hope that we would find others who agreed sustained the writing process. The research cluster's project hopes to avoid binaries of success and failure and rather explore the potentialities of considerations of identity and methods of collaboration to expand a culture of intellectual possibility. Indeed, as Anne Harris speculates in regards to her own experiences with digital collaboration and explorations of identity, such collaborations real value may be the ways in which they highlight our ongoing inability to bridge differences, define identity, and address exclusion, even in these rhizomatic times. 
To acknowledge that these reflections are far from representative and are deeply rooted in my own perspective as a Canadian graduate student in literary criticism, I want to wrap up with a few quotes to invite further speculation about the interconnections between identity politics, collaboration, and border crossing. In this context, Shohat and Stem, as well as Cult Mind Please, have provocative commentary for trans-hemispheric groups such as the Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange. The former pair states that the north-south divide, while heuristically and politically useful as pointing to deeply entrenched power differentials, is premised on overly stark lines of separation. The lines, in fact, are much more porous. While the latter maintains that, although rules and taboos are continuously challenged by new actors in the field, they are also a prime reason as to why patterns of identity politics have shown to be relatively stable and are fairly comparable in terms of regional distribution in the Americas. How fluid or constant are these borders between geography, culture, and identity? How does this impact the challenges and the rewards encountered by collaborations between border-traversing academic collectives? Thank you.